There's no um, departments at Tate. Um, all the curators work together, and we have a um, a very um, open way of <clears throat> working between different different specialisms, whether they be geographical or in terms of media and so on. The principle behind that is that photography should always be integrated into the collection. That um, we should always show photography alongside painting, sculpture, installation, film, performance, and it will always be um, properly part of the history of art. And that's something that was um, absolutely um, key when uh, the idea of having a photography curator was raised. Right at the beginning, the Tate decided that they would do this without having the kind of department structure that you have in American museums or in, in museums on the continent. Yeah. And, the, and acknowledging the fact that um, the museum hadn't um, collected photography uh, strategically um, in quite the right way in the past. So the idea of having somebody come on board, come into the curatorial team as a, um, somebody who could be a, an advocate for and an, you know, in theory an expert on um, photography was something that was felt to be missing from the team as a whole. Okay. Um, but not something that, um, that it was felt needed to be treated separately. And in fact, when you walk around Tate, you don't find suddenly some photography galleries with you know, low ceilings and carpet like you do in some other museums. It's all integrated with everything else. The exhibition program um, really, likewise, it's been very well, very much integrated into other things. So the first um, show that uh, happened since I started, well, the first one that I was responsible for was uh, William Klein and Dido Moriyama. And that show included film, painting, silk screens, books, installations. It really a way of showing that photography is not a, um, a separate um, sort of um, parallel history or parallel medium with, its own, with, a, with a separate history. That it's something that's always been um, absolutely part of the history of art. I think William Klein was a really important figure to start with, having you know, in fact started as a painter, gone on to become a filmmaker, um, been somebody who's really intellectually engaged with the idea of what an image is. Um, in the broadest sense, and you know, I think it was important for us to start with somebody like that um, to show that we were really open to photography in the broadest sense, and also in in the way that the show was, you saw photography in every many many different forms, from the photo book kind of on the page to vintage prints to to big installations and slideshows and, and and so on. I think that's really important for us. The, I guess the first thing to say is that um, we collect really carefully in relation to what other, um, let's say, local collections have been able to achieve. We're very aware of what our colleagues and partners in, in Pompidou in Paris have done, what our colleagues in Germany have done, um, and we try, we think really carefully about what, what is available locally before making acquisitions. I think, it, and you know, a really good example would be if you think of pre-war modernist photography, sort of Man Ray and Brassai and, and this kind of um, thing which have become incredibly valuable and scarce in the market and there are thousands and thousands and thousands of prints in, um, in the Pompidou. So a museum like the Pompidou has the most incredible collection of, of modernist photography and for us um, you know, we know that they have thousands of, they have the whole archive of Brassai, they have the whole estate of Man Ray and that's a, a thing where being very aware of that we put our energy in other directions. We know that we can. We work very well with our um, with our colleagues. And in fact, recently we've actually had a, a very major donation of works given to both the Pompidou and Tate together to, to to share together. And that's really fantastic. It's really important. And I think that the um, the idea of being aware of your of the resources that are you know, available locally helps us to be very strategic with what we're collecting. And one of the things we've done, for example, is concentrated very heavily on um, Japanese photography. And that was a very deliberate strategic decision based on the fact that n you know, other European museums hadn't really collected that. Mm -hmm. So it was very interesting for us to think about post-war Japan. It's a very interesting moment anyway. And it's something which is um, a major part of the collection here in sculpture and painting. So it's really a great thing for us, not only to con build something that con collect connects with our collection, but also something that's missing regionally. So within six years we have probably um, the, the best collection and that's because other people weren't collecting it. We're just starting the collection, we've been, right. we've been um, building um, the, the new strategy for photography since um, just six years, for just six years. And prior to that, there actually are a lot of photographs in Tate's collection, but there are a lot more photographs, as the, the old um, previous director of Tate used to say, there are a lot more photographs by artists than 
art by photographers. So we have a lot of Richard Long, Hamish Fulton, Baldessari, you know, the kinds of mm -hmm. conceptual works, John Hilliard, um, Keith Arnett, you know, we have a lot of that kind of work in the collection. Um, we also have quite a, a very um, good collection of, of, of Düsseldorf School, um, large format um, photography from the 90s. Um, but beyond that, uh, it was fairly, uh, fairly thin. So we started um, trying to think about how we could build a, a, a collection and how we could build a collection that fitted with other things in uh, in Tate's collection and other media. So we started for example with the Bauhaus and the idea of a, a sort of moment where photography was completely integrated with mm -hmm. design, architecture, painting um, so on. So we started looking at the Bauhaus. We've, we, we've basically made many connections from our collection in other media to, to photography at various different moments. Um, some of those things are very specific, um, so you know, photographs by people working in exactly the same place as a particular painter. Um, for example, we, we have a, a really good collection of Lewis Boltz, who is a kind of important for his relationship to minimalism. So we actually showed Lewis Boltz with Carl Andre, and they were shown in the same gallery in New York in the late 60s and early 70s, and we were able to sort of if you like, reunite the works, painting and sculpture in the same room in the permanent collection. So we're always trying to make these, these connections between what we have in the collection and what we want photographically. But the idea is to be as broad as possible. So we're not ruling things out and saying, well, oh, you know, Jim Goldberg doesn't really fit with anything else so we won't collect him. It's more making these connections, seeing how we can make things fit, and seeing how, how they can fit um, productively and usefully and, and look great in the collection. It was a big donation from the Roy Lichtenstein Foundation of work by Harry Schunk and Janos Kender, who we'll um, certainly talk about in a second when we talk about the performance show. But um, the Lichtenstein Foundation had, I believe, something in the region of 55,000 prints by these two, by this collaborative team. And they arranged for the donation to be divided between um, the Getty, MoMA, Pompidou and Tate. And Pompidou and Tate, myself and um, Didier Schulman from the Kandinsky Library, we got together and we sat down and we worked together to work out what would be the best way of housing things, the best way of having access to them, the best way of sharing them. And that's um, resulted in a fairly, fairly unusual but not unique agreement where they are holding and archiving a lot of material, but on an annual basis we, 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 um, we, take, we keep some of it here. So they'll permanently be part of the collection at Tate. Um, and in fact, for the performance show, we'll show quite a, quite a lot of it, which is great. Um, but they have 10,000 prints. So there's no problem sharing 10,000 prints. <laughs> and similarly, the, the Getty and MoMA shared you know, a very, very large number of prints. It's actually fairly easy to, to share um, resources at, at that scale. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also... Uh, it is symbolic in the sense that we um, we do think very carefully about collaborations with other museums, and it hasn't happened so often with acquisitions, although although it does. And, but it's usually time-based media. It's usually something that you can share by agreeing not to show it at the same time. But having ten thousand prints is obviously something that you can share. Some of these big, overarching, strategic um, uh, aspects of Tate's program, like performance, um, they are really part of. Um, they're not. As I said before, they're not the, um, the sole um, province of the performance um, team, curator um, Catherine Wood. Um, we all kind of are engaged in these ideas, and particularly when we're thinking about the collection. In fact, we've acquired quite a bit of photography that relates directly to performance, which is either the documentation of performance or photography, which is kind of performative in some way. And I think the show came out of discussions that Catherine and I had, and um, we're thinking a lot about what exactly the relationship between performance and photography is. And the, um, the, the recent um, donation of works by Schunk, Harry Schunk and Janos Kender to Tate and Pompidou were, uh, is an amazing archive of um, photographs of very important performances. There's Eve Klein's Anthropometries, there's Eve Klein's Leap into the Void, there's Kusama, Mnugin, Antin, Merce Cunningham, Trisha Brown. It's a really incredible archive. Um, we were looking at it, looking very carefully at the photographs and thinking, well, a lot of these things really surpass what was necessary to document a performance. There was a lot of 
creativity and um, a lot of um, Schunkender's own style in the um, in the work. And you can see, for example, in his in his in their photographs of um, Klein's anthropometries, you can see the original photograph of the room with you know the the uh, painted um, women being dragging each other around the floor, the very famous images that we see, but then that we, that we all um, remember. But then you'll also see where he's made a specific crop, enlargement crop, taken in a, you know, just part of the crowd, just a fragment of a figure, until they become really interesting works in their own right. And so what, what really we started, the, the idea of the show was, where, where is photography's place in relation to performance? Is it always a subordinate sort of documentary medium, or is it very often very engaged in performance and when we started thinking about this um, we were then we then got to this kind of really interesting question well isn't photography always performative aren't their performances right from the very beginning of the medium and if you think about um, Fox Talbot you know, the very earliest photographs he's in the grounds of Lake Abbey with his family getting them to pretend to be um, having a lunch or pretend mm -hmm. to do something and this idea of a kind of staging performativity in photography goes back very, very early. And we, we, we think, I mean, I think, uh, not being an expert on the 19th century, but I think, for example, um, Hippolyte Bayard's um, Le Noyer, the self-portrait as a drowned man, which is an incredible um, image. It's um, his despair at having his photographic process overlooked and, and Daguerre's process being acquired by the French state. He, he shows himself as, as having suicided himself um, as a drowned man, and it's called self-portrait as a drowned man, and it's a really incredible performance. He's pretending to be dead, and slumped over, kind of Marat-like, with um, you know, naked from the waist up, with his kind of incredibly um, stained, chemical stained or sunburned hands. It look very, very weird. It's a really weird thing. It's something that we might expect to see in the 1970s, mm -hmm. and so we sort of thought, well, look. Um, photography has always had this amazing relationship with performance. What happens if you switch things and rather than starting from the point of view of performance, you start from the point of view of photography and say, when is photography performative? When do performance and photography have this very close relationship? So the show will really explore, um, rather than 1850 to now, it will explore a range from definitely I'm a photographer documenting a performance to very, very performative photography. And somewhere along that scale, you have all the great things that you'd expect to see in a show of that kind. You have Cindy Sherman, Francesca mm -hmm. Woodman, Claude Cahun, and so on. But you also have some really um, unique and unusual um, works. Uh, I think some of the most amazing images are those where there is actually a collaboration between the, the performer and the photographer. Um, if you think of um, Nadar's photographs of Piero, of the mime, where he invited the, the mime to come into his studio and perform his different facial expressions just for the camera, something he would have usually done on stage or on the street. Um, this is an incredibly um, unique early collaboration between a photographer and an actor. And we've sort of traced that idea through to the 1970s, late 60s, early 70s, with Aiko Hozoi, the Japanese um, photographer, who made all his work and um, published his work as collaborations. So Kamai Tachi, for example, is made with uh, Buto, founder of Buto, Tatsumi Hijikata. And the book, Kamaitachi, says, photographs, Aiko Hozoi, performance, Tatsumi Hijikata. They're equally credited, which I think is, I think it's unique in the history of, certainly in the history of the photo book, but probably in the history of photography, that the, the subject, um, given that the author, you know, putatively, the author is Hozoi, but the subject of the photographs is given equal, um, equal billing. I think this is really fascinating. So mm -hmm. somewhere in the middle, you have this incredible sense of collaboration. And then from each side, you have maybe more emphasis on the performer, mm -hmm. more emphasis on the photographer. And you can kind of go in both directions. And, and also um, not to forget that so much everyday kinds of photography are performative. You know, there are many things that we do in our own lives with mm -hmm. cameras that are very performative. They're not natural. You know, we're often performing for the camera right. in our daily lives, so we wanted oh, to yeah. <laughs> um, acknowledge that, that fact. It's, I guess it's an argument again, it's a, mm. a, a, an idea that says performance and photography have this interesting relationship and much performance has been 
creatively photographed and much photography is very performative so it you know it sort of takes these two ideas i guess we're seeking to bring things into context that you wouldn't expect to see next to one another so the f the first room as we're imagining it at the moment you'll have eve klein's very famous leap into the void and a series of aaron siskin's um, terrors and pleasures of levitation you know different ways of thinking about performing and flying through the air at the same time you know this kind of and also breaking down these barriers that you were talking about before between what we think of as like um, art, like Eve Klein is an artist and Aaron Siskin is a photographer. Well, mm -hmm. you know, why do we need to keep those two things in opposition? It's very interesting to bring them closer together. So really, um, yeah, not a survey, but but definitely uh, um, ranging historically from the age, from the middle of the 19th century to now, and covering many different kinds of practice. So. Um, but, but not to comprehend, it couldn't be comprehensive, I guess. I guess one of the things we, we were trying to do with conflict time photography was to, um, to show that photography is a lot more sophisticated and complex than um, the idea of you know, the war reporter happening to be in the right place at the right time and taking the picture because they're there. Um, that photography can be reflective, can be thoughtful, can be sensitive and philosophical. That photographers can make work about the past not just what's in front of the camera. I thought that was a really, really interesting um, idea. And it, as you said, it came from Slaughterhouse Five. It came from the fact that it took Kurt Vonnegut 24 years to write his war book. And many of the great photographers that we showed in the exhibition took a long time to make their work. We, we didn't really, you know, as curators, as people who are not, not working in that field, we didn't take a position mm -hmm. ourselves. We, we tried to show through the work of the artists included in the show try to highlight some of these issues and I think in the exhibition having um, Brumbergs and Chandler in The Day Nobody Died which is a very specific critique of embedding mm -hmm. next to Don McCullin's Shellshock Marine yeah. which McCullin always says could never be made now it's a picture that we will never see now mm -hmm. um, I think we we sort of put those things next to each other and then left the audience to to make up their minds about you know what that might mean there was a big issue involved around that kind of um, photojournalistic practice and the changing, changing status of, of reportage as such. In fact, the idea of conflict time photography was almost that it left photojournalism behind because of the way that it was structured. So only the first room was about the moment and that all of the rest of the show was about looking backwards. Having done the war show, the next one should be fun.